Cool. Right, so uh, we're starting a little bit early. Um, for this talk, which I've entitled Knowing Your Arm from Your Ass, and uh, that's British English, and a few people have said, What's an ass? I said, You'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, for those of you who haven't looked it up, um, stay tuned. Uh, and the sort of more polite, less British Englishy uh, title for this presentation is How to Identify the CPU Features in Your Phone. Now, it's just after lunch, you might all just doze off because it's warm and it's dark and you're full, but it's hopefully a bit more interesting than that subtitle makes it sound. But first, uh, if I can make this work. Let's have a look. Sorry, one second. There we are. Okay, it's kind of, well, we'll, we'll see. I'll keep, keep some of it on the, on the display. Um, so just a disclaimer, I don't work for ARM anymore. Um, I used to, uh, but this presentation was done while I was there. And they kindly sponsored this conference and my travel to be here, so thank you very much, Arm. You can see them down there in lowercase uh, and here, and they're in uppercase on my slide because I don't keep up with the marketing stuff. And because I, I also wanted to capitalize us because it makes it sound like it stands for something. Uh, I normally give pretty low-level technical talks um, about memory models or concurrency or TLBs, things, really fun things like that. Uh, this one is actually a bit of a change for me because it's more going to be about uh, terminology, uh, how to identify things, uh, CPU features in your SOC. Um, so yeah, if you want to interrupt me halfway through or just whenever, give me a shout for the blue things there, I'll try and hurl this at you and we'll see how we do. So introduction, uh, I'm the ARM64 co-maintainer in the Linux kernel, which is why I know a little bit about ARM and I've worked there for a decade in the open source group. Uh, I made significant contributions to not just the Linux kernel architecture code, but also to actually the ARM architecture itself, um, in parts of the memory model and the system architecture as well. So I've kind of been involved both on the, what you might think of as the hardware side, although I don't write Verilog or VHDL, um, but I've also been involved with the, the software side. And during my time at ARM, I was obviously very exposed to what, what's called the ARM ecosystem, and I'll talk a bit more about this later on, but this is, this is the select collection of companies that work together to produce ARM designs, it's not just you know, your Samsungs and your Qualcomms, there's lots and lots and lots of companies that uh, design with ARM and uh, write software for ARM as well. So it's an exciting thing to work, uh, work as part of, but you're, you're in kind of quite, even though you work for, you know, the ARM, you're quite a small player in, in this big ecosystem. So there's lots of, um, it's a bit like the mailing list, but everyone's polite, right? It's kind of the way it works. I tend to be CPU centric, um, just because that's my background. I try not to be, but it, yeah, bear that in mind. And my sort of one takeaway th that I had is that developing system software for the ARM architecture, if you don't work for ARM, is really, really hard. Um, the documentation that, that is available can be quite difficult to read. It's sort of written in, instead of English, it's written in ARMglish. <laughs> and you, you get used to the terminology, and then the problem is you get used to it, and you start writing like it. Right? So you sort of make the problem worse. So I'll try to explain a little bit about how to decipher some of this stuff, um, because I think it's, you know, it's obviously very important for ARM and for the ecosystem that people who maybe traditionally develop for, for x86 um, or, or other embedded platforms, in fact, can move to ARM without having to learn ARM English. <laughs> so that's an ARS, <laughs> <laughs> for those who didn't know. And the difference is quite obvious because that's an ARM. Uh, <laughs> but that's kind of, you know, I could stop now and say any questions, but there is a real presentation here. I just wanted to get that out of the way. So I think getting it out of the way is probably the right thing to do. I hired a builder just for that, no. <laughs> I couldn't afford that, probably. <laughs> uh, so here's, here's some example, I think, of um, how you might run into confusing terminology when you're working with um, ARM. So I'm just gonna uncover a series of bullets, which are all true facts. And you can see if you understand it still when I get to the bottom, and if you do, maybe you should be working at ARM. So first of all, so ARM7, who here has heard of ARM7? Well, hey, okay, it's really popular. Um, there's a 32-bit uh, ARM CPU, well it is, was, because it's quite old, right, 20 years old, and it implements ARM v3. So you've already got this, hang on, it's, it's ARM7, implements ARM v3, you know, what happened to the four in the middle, what's this V, pretty weird. <laughs> but actually the, the really popular version is the ARM7 TDMI, which I suspect is the one that you've all heard of. It's the in-joker ARM is the, it's that that pays your wages, not the big fancy <laughs> stuff. Uh, that was particular, particularly popular to the point that they, you know, they doubled the length of the CPU name TDMI, and the T means thumb. Um, keep that in mind, because thumb will come up again in a minute. 
So you've got the ARM7 TDMI, which is a form of the ARM7, which implements ARMv3. <laughs> but nowadays, most 32-bit uh, ARM CPUs tend to implement ARMv7A. Okay, so now you've got most 32-bit CPUs implement ARMv7A, but not the ARM7 TDMI, which is a version of ARM7 that implements ARMv3. <laughs> Doing well so far. But uh, V7A, it's got a hyphen. People don't like hyphens, right? So we'll just say ARMv7. So ARMv7 is kind of a short form of ARMv7A. Uh, I'm going to get this wrong. <laughs> which is what most 32-bit CPUs use, unlike ARM7 TDMI, which is a version of ARM7 which implements ARMv3. I'm going to have to stop doing this. Because then, like, there was a, a, another 32-bit uh, CPU which implements ARMv7A or ARMv7, and that's called the Cortex-A7. But again, there's a hyphen, so people call it A7. And that implements them too, but it's not an A7T2, it's just an A7. So the A7 is an abbreviation of Cortex A7 that implements ARMv7A, which is a control, oh, can't do it. <laughs> you keep going, and it gets worse because then there's another processor called the Apple A7, which according to Wikipedia is a 64-bit CPU and is not related in whatsoever to the A7, which is ARMv7, which doesn't have 64-bit, so, ah. <laughs> and A7 implements, it's got some cool extensions, actually implements virtualization, you can run KVM. Uh, it's SMP. Unlike the Cortex A8, which is a much older processor and doesn't implement either of those things, it just, <laughs> how did they come up with this? But don't worry, because the new processor that was recently announced is called the Cortex A77. <laughs> and that implements ARMv8, so it's obviously 64 bit. But the Cortex A32 also implements ARMv8, and that's only 32 bit. So <laughs> it's almost like they're trying to make it difficult, you know? And I could have come up with other examples. This was just, you know, I started writing and this is where I ended up. And actually, it's not just me that, um, that thinks like this. Also, you know, Linus Torvalds. So if you, if you search for Angry Penguin, this is the picture you get. And I think he was an angry penguin when he started shouting at us uh, a few years ago. You know, they have separate, they um, have uh, separate versions for their architecture, example, ARMv8, <laughs> and for their implementation, example, ARM11. So he's picked two different versions, but it's similar to my previous slide. And maybe it all makes sense if you've drunk the ARM Kool-Aid and have joined the ARM cult, but to sane people and outsiders, it's, um, it's a mess. <laughs> so I'm going to be kind and say that you're all either sane people or outsiders. And you can choose which side of that fence you're on. Um, but he continues, at Christ, seriously, the insanity is so strong in the ARM version name that it burns. If it really makes sense to anyone that ARM A9, technically Cortex A9, but no one seems to use that. It's an ARMv7 thing, which is completely different from ARM9, which is intended for, so it's, it's, it's the same from the previous slide, but he's just like incremented all the numbers, or more likely he decremented them for mine. So it's, it, people are confused. <laughs> so I, I'd like you to join me and drink some ARM Kool-Aid, <coughs> and we'll figure out what's going on. <laughs> so what you might think is, okay, this is gobbledygook, um, but it's all written down, so we can just go and read the documentation. So let's see how well that goes. <laughs> There's this bloody great big book which is called the arm arm, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so you can't find it. Actually, I tried Googling for arm. If you Google for arm, you get the arm, and if you Google arm arm, you do get the book. L when I tried it a couple of days ago. So, you know, perhaps I shouldn't be too nasty, but really, it's just, so that's, that's the arm architecture reference manual, obviously, you know, it wasn't, wasn't forced. <laughs> and it's 8,000 pages long, which is quite long, uh, especially, the, you know, it's, it's written in, like I said, arm glitch is this is the sort of style of prose which is um, sort of fact after fact after rule after, it's, it's not, um, you know, once upon a time there was an arm seven. It's, it's quite difficult to read. <laughs> um, it's mostly up to date, but the, the release schedule is sporadic. I think that's being improved. But the architecture it does actually change weekly because they're obviously doing bug fixes and things like that. When you've got something of this size, you can't, you know, leave it for months on end without updating it. But the, the book does, does lag a little bit. And it's not intended to be a learning resource which is annoying, so maybe it's not gonna help us. Uh, it's also deliberately avoids going into CPU implementation detail, so you won't find any mention of store buffers, or you won't find reorder buffers, or you know, microarchitectural things in there. It, it's really describing, as I'll come to a bit later, it's describing the higher level properties of the architecture so that you can uh, write software which is portable across multiple CPU implementations. That's what this book is about. <laughs> and I was thinking about it, and I, I got this did you know fact if, you, if for every ARM CPU that shipped, you printed out a copy of this book and laid it end to end, it's one of those facts, uh, it would go to Mars and back 500 times. I think you'd run out of paper. That's, that's a long way, right? Now, I could be off by many orders of magnitude, but assuming my quick hacking on a piece of paper was right, it, that's, that's a lot. So here's a helpful extract from that book. <laughs> 
Hmm. So it starts off, any interrupt that is pending before a context synchronization event, that's got a capital C, so it probably means something. So you're gonna have to go and look that up, which is gonna be elsewhere in the book and it's gonna be a rabbit hole. So maybe a couple of days later, you pop your stack and you're back here, right? Context synchronization event. What was I trying to look up? <laughs> and then, okay, so in the following list, okay, so these must all be them. So let's just take the second and the third one. I mean, it says if arm v8.5 dash, it's another hyphen, uh, dash uh, CSEH is not implemented, or if arm v8.5 dash CSEH is implemented and the appropriate, appropriate? SELRAEIX.IS bit is set, then that must be one of these things. It's just kind of, you, you, you've just got more terminology that you need to go and learn. You're not going to learn the terminology by reading this unless you kind of just absorb it over a long period of time. What you need to be able to do really is talk to somebody who understands it or hopefully wrote it. And that's difficult when you don't work for them, uh, work for them. So I would say this is not the Kool-Aid that we're looking for. <laughs> um, and that's the, the first hurdle I would say is that um, ARM is mostly inaccessible to developers on the outside. There are efforts to fix this, uh, certainly, but it's, it's difficult. It's, this book is hard to read. And it's not just the ARM one. I mean, other architectures books are also difficult to read. And I think half of the battle in cracking uh, this nuts, the, the inaccessibility, is understanding the terminology. Because there's a lot of terminology that's banded about um, a second nature to, uh, to, the, to people who are working on this stuff. And I'm gonna go through a, through a few of them in this talk, not all of them. But things like the distinction between architecture and microarchitecture is super important uh, to understand, to appreciate why the ARM arm is written like it is. Because actually, it's a, they didn't write it like that to be difficult, even though you probably think that. Uh, it, is, it is written that way for a reason. <laughs> so architecture, um, as I said earlier, it's kind of this high level contract. So it's the contract between hardware and software. So it describes the portable guarantees provided uh, by the hardware without dictating how they're implemented. So I won't say your store buffer needs to have four entries, but it might say, you know, writes hit memory in a finite time, okay? Um, <laughs> it's typically specified in English. Uh, unfortunately, there's quite, there is some work, um, particularly in the memory model, to specify it in maths, which may horrify you <laughs> more than it uh, pleases you. But actually, if you specify it in maths, you can then write executable models that are architecturally correct. And then you can play around with it. And you can say, hey, if I change it this way, how would my program behave? And that, I think that's very helpful. To make it complicated, they have three architecture profiles, which are named A, R, and M. <laughs> oh, it's the same guy that wrote the book. Uh, so actually, the, what you should do for that is, I mean, for, for Linux, and especially 64-bit, you can just stick with A. I mean, it's the A class cores that I'm, I mostly care about uh, for running 64-bit Linux. And that's, that's you know, the 8,000-page book is the A class uh, manual. And there's, there's a, approximately a five-year lag. So if you have a cool idea, um, you go, hey, Arm, I've got this great idea. What about an instruction that makes the CPU catch fire? And they go, oh, that's a really interesting instruction. Yeah, we'll have it in CPUs, but it takes about five years before it before it shows up and you can set fire to people's phones. <laughs> so it's, it's a long-term thing. They typically don't standardize or try not to standardize you know, features that won't be relevant in five years' time because there would be no point. On the other hand, microarchitecture is the design of a specific piece of hardware. So you know the Cortex-A7077 or whatever it was. Uh, that one's a specific design. It's a specific piece of RTL written in something like Verilog and that refers to that particular CPU which will implement some version of the architecture. <laughs> so as an analogy, which may or may not help, if you think of uh, the programs written in C, so the, the C language standard from the ISO standards committee, that would be the sort of like the architecture, whilst the source code for your tool chain, your compiler, your C library would be sort of like the implementation of that standard. Um, <laughs> one interesting thing here is that ARM develops both the architecture and the microarchitecture as licensable products. So you can come to ARM and you can say, I'd like to, uh, have the, I'd like to build the A77 and put it into my device. Or you might say, actually, no, I think I can design a much better CPU than the A77. I'd like to license the architecture and do my own CPU from the ground up. Um, <laughs> and this sort of distinction is therefore really important to the way that ARM works, the way that you write software for ARM. And on other architectures such as x86, it's far less significant. So it can be a, a kind of thing that takes people a while to get their head around and they mix up architecture and microarchitecture, which can if you do that on ARM and you get it mixed up, you get all your abstractions wrong for the software. Because what you want is your software to rely only on the architecture stuff. Otherwise, it runs on a new core and it all explodes. So here's kind of a little bit of uh, history. Um, 
for how the development of the architecture has looked. So pre-V4, up to V4, I'm just saying dinosaurs roam the earth, I'm not gonna talk about that. But uh, <laughs> from V5 onwards, you can kind of see, so on the left-hand side, you've got the architecture version. And it looks pretty sensible, right? Because they're ignoring the A that appears at RMD7. Um, it, you know, they're adding one to a number, which is pretty good, uh, except for these little bits down here where it becomes 0 0.1, 0 0.2. Uh, and then the, the middle column is the, the date, roughly, when that architecture was announced. <laughs> um, so you can see RMD5 to V6 was a couple of years, three more years to V7, then a big long gap to V8, because V8's where 64-bit came in, so it was obviously a lot of work to... Uh, producers and you know, a brand new instruction set essentially between that and then since then they've moved to this dot one dot two dot three and you can see that's very regularly done on an annual tick so right now you've got uh, v8.5 from last year I, you know i wonder what could be next um i wouldn't like to guess so it's the opposite of linux steve so so anyway, then you've got in the sort of paler blue, if you can see the distinction, the third column across, there's, I've just picked a feature that was present in that. Uh, I'll get it if you want. <laughs> right. Um, so for example, uh, I lost my train of thought now. Yeah, so for V6, we, we kind of got SMP, it wasn't very good. Um, and that was then properly done in V7. And V7, we had virtualization, we had some stuff to the MNU, and then you can see through these 8.1 things, we're adding things like new atomic instructions and security enhancements for pointer authentication. There's a lot more than one feature per revision. I just picked some because, you know, there's no one for you on the slide. And then the final one on the right is a, a CPU that implements that version of the architecture. So you can see the Cortex A8 implements v 7 a So you, just as an example, <laughs> and really that you can't, Unfortunately, from the naming, you can't figure that out. It's just you need to look it up. Uh, and another confusing thing I found when I put together these slides is apparently uh, there's a CPU from Apple called Vortex, which implements speed 8.3. So now you've got Cortex and Vortex, which is, ah, these people learn. Um, but that was just on, on Wikipedia, so it could be wrong, but that's what it said. <laughs> so many of these things are also optional, which is a bit of a pain. So you can't say, hey, I'm 8.3, I've got pointer authentication. Well, maybe you can with that. that could be a mandatory one, I don't remember off the top of my head, but some of them are optional. Um, so actually, even if you uh, are writing portable system software, you still have to go and read ID registers to figure exactly what you've got in your core. You can't rely on them generally being present just because you know that you're an 8.3 chip. <laughs> so why is the product naming so inconsistent? Um, I'm not gonna say completely down to the licensing model because there's definitely an aspect of creative marketing. Um, and information sort of disinformation to confuse you into uh, knowing really what's there. But a large part of it is because of the, the way that things are licensed. So actually, if you, if you get a core license, which is what I was on about earlier on, you say, hey, I want this specific core, the A77, to put into my SOC, you can buy that from ARM, and they'll say, right, here's the A77, fill your boots, and you might be allowed to make minor modifications in conjunction with ARM. It's kind of, I'm not clear, completely clear on what you are and aren't allowed to do. Um, but we'll see more of that later on because I'm going to show some examples of some SOCs. Um, alternatively, yeah, like I said, there's this architecture one where you design your own one from scratch. Sounds good. And you can call it whatever you like. Um, so you could call it, well, you probably can't call it a Cortex because I think that's a trademark. But it, you, you could call it, you know, um, Linux CPU 9000 if you wanted to, if Linux Foundation was happy. Um, and an interesting thing that comes out of this, it also means that the architecture partners are indirect competitors because if someone buys a license from you for an architecture and they design their own chip, that's now competing with the chips that ARM produces. So ARM has to work with this person to support them on their architecture, but they're also competing with them. So I, I think that probably muddies the waters for how people name their CPUs because they don't want it to, you know, they're, they're competing essentially. <laughs> and it also means that Unfortunately, it's, it's uh, important that ARM doesn't produce production silicon as an SOC because then they, they will be seen as competing with their own customers. So a lot of the problem with um, you know, accessibility to dev boards and things like that uh, is quite, it kind of stems from this, this problem where if they, were, if they produce something that was actually really decent uh, SOC, then the customers say, hang on a minute, stop invading our space. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a very difficult balancing act where, um, which they've managed to maintain and hats off to them for that. And to give you an idea of the scale of the ecosystem, I nicked these uh, marketing slides. Uh, but there's, I mean, there's just 
tons and tons and tons of logos. So these, this, I think this is slightly outdated, but um, and there are big companies on here. There's a Samsung there and a Qualcomm and a you know, Microsoft and the huge, 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 huge companies, especially compared to what you know the size of as Arm as a company. And all these people are you know partners or licensees in some way or another. Um, so a massive amount going on. And if you want to make a change, you need to convince them all. <laughs> you know, or at least all the ones for that license. So there's a lot of um, heated discussion that goes on to, to make these sort of changes. So the kind of the, the joke that I've heard banded about is that uh, Arm ends up playing Switzerland. They can't really choose sides. Uh, it's in their interest not to, not to, uh, you know, be on one side or the other. Just to kind of steer the, the, the technology technological discussion in the way that it, it should go to, to come to a conclusion. <laughs> and if you look at in revenue terms, and these are just pulled straight off Google or Wikipedia, so they, they could be wrong, and they're kind of hard to compare. But it, I think it gives you a rough idea. If you look at the sort of revenue figures for over the last few years for these companies, at Qualcomm, 22 billion, a lot of money. Intel, 70 billion. Samsung, 211 billion dollars. And then ARM comes in. Does anyone want to guess what, what ARM is? How much? 200 million was the guess. So I've got a, an old number in GBP before they were taken over. Okay, so it was less than a billion pounds um, in 2015, which is, you know, so sorry. <laughs> in 2015, I, it was probably a lot more. Um, <laughs> let's not go there. Uh, <laughs> talking of asses, but um, strongly recommend. And then they put it, they put it in like typeface capital. So we really strongly recommend this. Um, but you, you, it's not a lot of stuff you can enforce because people will just say, "Well, if you're going to force us to do that, sorry, we're out." Um, you need to write resolve to debate. And that, that brings us on to the diversity and fragmentation because they're not able to uh, force things. Um, you end up with this sort of pick and mix architecture. I, I mean, that would, I wouldn't be thanked for saying that, but from a software point of view, that's kind of what it looks like. Uh, <laughs> it's reined in slightly by the desire for software reuse. People that nowadays do want to just take um, a mainline Linux kernel and a standard distribution and probably a reasonably standard uh, bootloader or firmware and have it work without too much modification. You know, a few years ago, people would write everything from scratch every single time. Not, not anymore, but even so, um, <laughs> like I say, it's, it's tough to mandate very much. And the way I see it, it's a bit like a, a conference buffet, although not the one here. The one here is very good. Um, but often, you know, particularly American conferences, you go to these buffets and you join the queue. And you get to the front, you go, oh, chicken, I'll have that. And you get to the next one, oh, fish, I'll have that. And you get to the next one. And it's just like a combination of foods which you would never consider putting on the same plate when you're at home. <laughs> and you, you get to the end of the buffet and you think, that looks revolting. And you eat it, and then you go and do it again, right? Maybe in the other order, to just work out what order to pile them on top of each other. And it's a bit like that. You, you get all sorts of funny architecture features getting mixed together, uh, which perhaps if you stood back and thought about it a bit more, you might not have done it like that. There are some standards that have, have actually caused some traction. So PSCI is what we use in Linux for bringing up CPUs and bending them down for power, power management, um, CPU hot plug, things like that. And, uh, there's a document called the SBSA, which sets out some uh, sort of levels that you can design your server chip around. Um, and then, you know, if you, if you comply to SBSA level whatever, then you can take uh, an enterprise distribution and just have it work. That's the idea. And the other thing that Arm have been doing a lot of is actually just an upstream first approach. So the architecture support um, is upstreamed into things like Linux, into KVM, into trusted firmware, which is on, on GitHub, way in advance of there being any silicon. So actually, you, you don't have to worry. As long as you comply to the architecture, it should just work. <laughs> but there is still this tendency towards fragmentation. And I encourage you to read this, uh, uh, this blog entry. Um, it's called something like the undebuggable bug from hell or something like that. I can't remember exactly. But what, what happened was um, somebody built a chip. And the, the pick and mix nature, again, we have, uh, well, you must have heard of Big Little. Who, who's heard of Big Little here? All right, because for those of you who haven't, it allows you to basically take any two, any two um, CPUs and put them on the same SOC. So they can be of different architecture revisions. They're not supposed to be, but again, Switzerland. So <laughs> you end up with these, these SOCs where perhaps the CPUs aren't completely identical from Linux's point of view. And this, this marvelous story is about a case where the instruction cache line size was different. So what the, what happened on this is you'd be running on one CPU, uh, the JIT, say, uh, JavaScript JIT or something. I think it was the mono uh, JIT. <laughs> we go, right, I've written some fancy uh, new code. I need to invalidate the iCache to make sure you can run it. And these messages will be broadcast to the other core with a different 
by cache length, and you'd end up missing every other line. So every other instruction cache line would still have the old data in, and eventually your, CP, your uh, thread would migrate, and you'd get a SIG ill. Yeah, and how do you debug? Because it would happen so rarely. Debugging, it's horrible. So uh, <laughs> this is now, uh, Linux kernel fixes this for us now. I'll talk about that in a minute. But Linux basically says we have to provide an SMP illusion to, to user space. Um, and in this case, you can lie about the iCache size, uh, line size. So here we go. Yeah, how does Linux cope? Right, time. Oh, big time. So how does Linux cope? So Linux kernel is written to the architecture. So we don't tend to write to a specific CPU implementation because to do that would, first of all, the, the code itself would become very messy. For example, w there were days when people wanted to put in a new version of memcopy for every core that came out, and it's just not maintainable. And, and also with that sort of code, once the CPU has kind of fallen out of favor, it's just rotten memcopy code that you don't want to have to carry around. So it's better to try and write. I mean, writing memcopy to the architecture is not really possible either because the architecture doesn't state very much about performance, but you can often write something that's kind of good enough for everybody. Um, and we aim to abstract away the bag of bits that have been baked into the silicon. So we, we look at um, when the CPUs come up, um, we look at all the features that they have, and once we've seen all the CPUs, we then work out the common intersection, and that's what we advertise to user space, and that's what we support. And mostly that works, except in the case of uh, CPU errata and apparently side channels. I'm not going to talk too much about those. But uh, there are cases where, unfortunately, you do have to know about the microarchitecture. You know, if people have, if, if there's a bug with one particular type of CPU, then unfortunately you have to detect that and you have to act on it. <laughs> um, yeah, heterogeneous systems are a headache, as I hopefully gave you an example of earlier on. <coughs> and if you're in user space, you can look at this stuff via prop, via sys, uh, elf. Um, and also these instructions called MRS, which allow you to read the ID registers from the CPU, they're not available to user space, but we emulate them in the kernel. So actually, if you, if you try to use that, uh, you will get a sanitized view. So if you try and read an instruction ID register, you know, do I support these instructions? We'll trap it, emulate it, and if, if you've got it on all of the cores, then you'll see that it's supported. And that's documented in here. You can have a look at that. Or email us on the list, and we'll try to help you. <laughs> One kind of scary thing about how we do all of this um, is that we require uh, a single binary image to work on everything. All right, so you, you build the kernel, you get your image, which is unfortunately quite big because we're supporting everything. Um, and you should be able to just deploy that on any SOC and have it work. So we have to assume, well, we can't assume the presence of any architecture extensions by default. So we, we come up as plain old ARMB 8.0. Uh, and once we've detected things, we then run time, modify the kernel instructions to support the various bits and pieces that we have. And that's quite scary because you can end up, if you're not careful, you end up modifying the code that's doing the modifying. Um, and that goes really wrong sometimes. I, there, I think there were, maybe there still are cases where actually you take a spin lock, do the modifying, and then you unlock the spin lock, and the unlock has been patched. So you need to make sure your modified unlock is compatible with the lock. And it seems to work. <laughs> All right, so let me see if I can, I'll just show you that actually. If I can, oh, it's not going to work. Give me one second. Moved, yes. Uh, oops, it is. Sorry about this. Sorry? <laughs> this is Linux, yeah. Oh, I don't know, it's, it's the one that we're giving you. So, <laughs> it is. Ooh. Jesus Christ, I was just trying to make that bigger. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I can. Oh, I don't know. I, did, I tried Control Plus, and it does that. OK. Yeah, it'd be super easy if I could actually see what I'm doing right now. OK. Well, let's see. It's not a very exciting demo. But I'm just, I was just going to basically run, run QMU so you can see. Here, so if you see here, I'm running it as a Cortex A57 on the top, minus CPU A57. And this is just a 5.3 image that I, I built the other day, because it only came out the other day. So if I run that, it's on QEMU, right? So give me a chance. 
if we go back up here, <laughs> right, okay, so we detected two CPUs here, right? Now, earlier on, we'll have found the boot CPU here. So when we find the boot CPU, oh, we found some erratum, right? Because now it's an emulated A57, but at that point we've said, oh, we're on A57. We know that these parts of the CPU are pretty dodgy. But luckily we know how to work around that. So at that point, we apply the workarounds straight away because we don't want to wait. We need to do this for this particular call. Um, and at the same time, we detect a few features, although this, those features are really all about side channels. And... Um, <laughs> Then we, uh, so that's the side channel sorted out and some erratum. And then later on we uh, find another CPU and at that point we say, right, okay, we've seen all the cores. Uh, so now we can actually detect system-wide features. So for example, in this case, we know we can run, EL0 means user space, so this means we know we can run 32-bit user space applications. <laughs> so that's kind of how the detection is working. By that point, we're sorted and the kernel is patched. Now if I come back down to the bottom, Steve guesses the password wrong. <laughs> so then you can see in, in LSCPU, there's some bits and pieces about the, the core. And at the bottom, there's these flags. So these are in proxy PU info as well. And these tell you, a bit like on x86, some of the architectural features that are supported on your core. And we've deliberately given them silly names so that you don't know what they mean. But um, actually, there's, uh, there's something in documentation which defines what these mean. And specifically, they're defined in terms of, if this is set, then this ID register must have this value. And the, the CPU ID one at the end means you can do this MRS instruction and it'll be emulated. So that's that. Now if I try to run it again, uh, I can't bother to shut that. It's probably good enough. So you can change this. We'll run it again. the same kernel image, we've just changed QMU to say, uh, or basically to lie about a lot of the ID registers. So it'll still look like an A57, um, but it's going to claim that it supports, well, it will. It will support many more features than an A57 really supports, because QMU can just emulate them. <laughs> it goes much slower when you're doing this, because it's, it's emulating all the... Um oh, yeah, I could go up and have a look at that. I was just going to do an LSCPU, but... If you go uh, back, no, we've got to go past PCI again. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so for example, yeah, so we found these fancy atomic instructions, so they're part of 8.1, and we found a scalable vector extension as well, which is the variable length uh, vectors that you can have. Um, but we'll have still thought that it was a, an A57. So that's just kind of showing you how the same binary image can detect these things and turn them on and off. And if you come down to this, Deacon, there we are. <laughs> You, you know, wow, it wrapped the tiny little window I had. But this, you can see that there, there's Atomics. So Atomics is the LSE Atomics, right? And SVE is the Scalable Vector Extension. And there's a bunch of other crypto things that we've got. So that's just kind of the rough idea of if you've got access to one of these, that, that's how you find out what your, your CPU has. So how do I go back? Oh, it was going so well. Yep. There we are. Somehow it works. So now with that, um, I'm going to just walk through some examples. I've got, yeah, I've got time. Uh, some example SOCs, and we'll, I'm not going to boot Linux on them, but uh, I'll show you kind of how to figure out what's in them. And they, I picked three where one of them is pretty good to figure out what's in there, and then the other two is much more difficult. So this is kind of what you can do. Ignore all the marketing gunk, identify the SOC, then try and figure out what CPUs are in that SOC. Are they from ARM or not? Find out the architecture version, and then from that you can find out the features. And Wikichip is your friend. It's, Obviously, I can't endorse it, <laughs> but uh, they have lots of useful information on there. <laughs> so I thought I'd start off with the Libra computer, La Frit, because we got given one, and you know, let's see what they say about it. So they say, uh, this is from the website, the AML S5, uh, S805AC is the perfect development platform. I don't think there's an ID register for that. Uh, for projects that require highly performant ARM Cortex-A class CPUs, uh, small compact form factor, secure and non-secure 1080p media delivery, and playback, high reliability and low power. Okay, that's what they say. Now that's actually reasonably good because not only has it identified the SOC, it's also identified the, well, not quite, it's, it's hinted at where the CPUs might be coming from. We don't know which highly performant ARM Cortex-A class CPUs there are, but they're probably made by ARM. <laughs> 
So that's a good start, and that's m much better than most people do. So, yep, the SOC is down, the Amlogic uh, S1805X, and it's actually four ARM Cortex A53 cores, which ARM says, well, that's the most widely used with balanced performance and efficiency. So I'm not quite sure what that, if that goes with highly performant or not. I mean, I guess you have to run some benchmarks. But they'd probably mention performance um, <laughs> more than it's balanced. <laughs> um, but it's still, I mean, this, this, of the three that I'm showing, this is definitely the best one for, for figuring out what's in there. So A53, you can look that up. It's 64-bit, implements ARMv8.0, so it doesn't have any of those sub-bullets that I showed you earlier on. And if you have a big little design, one of these heterogeneous designs, particularly the early ones, this was normally the little, um, which again, you know, it's, it's a diminutive, so perhaps for performance, not highly performant. But either way, I, you know, I give it a, a, a thumbs up for the figuring out what's in your SOC. So now let's try a more difficult one. But let's go for a product. So it's the Samsung Galaxy S9. So they say, this is from the Samsung website, uh, 10 nanometer, 64-bit octa-core processor, 2.8 gigahertz plus 1.7 gigahertz, maximum clock speed, performance core, and efficiency core. So it's not big little now. It's performance and efficiency. I don't know whether that one's uh, really slow and that one uses loads of power, but they, they chose those words. <laughs> so um, <laughs> let's try and figure out what it is. Um, and I, I, yeah, it doesn't even say ARM, actually, does it? Well, yes, yeah, so the SOC in Europe, because that's another thing to realize, is that actually the Samsung Galaxy 9 is a different SOC depending on where you live. Um, and in Europe, it's the Exynos 9810. Uh, wicked trip to the rescue, because I couldn't really find anything about this. It claims that it's, it's this thing called a four mongoose three plus four Cortex A55. Okay, so that last one sounds like an ARM marketing name. Um, you know, remember, they trademarked that, and it's not Vortex, it's Cortex. Uh, but what's a, what on earth is a mongoose? I've not mentioned that. So the Cortex A55, yes, it's designed by ARM, implements ARMv8.2. If you look up mongoose 3, it's designed by ARM, uh, by Samsung, and implements ARMv8.0. So you, you, know, you might spot a problem here, which is that Linux is going to try and bring these all up as SMP. <laughs> and you know, I'm pretty sure they added something between 8.0 and 8.2. So that might cause you a problem. And there's another fun link, a big little problem, a tale of big little gone wrong. Um, <laughs> so in this case, sure enough, uh, there are instructions implemented, the LSE atomic instructions that I showed you probing in QEMU earlier on, are implemented in the A55 and not the Mongoose 3. And this issue was about the Go runtime, so you'd have your Go application running, and it's like, yeah, great, I've got the uh, A.2 atomic, so I'm going to use them because they're really fast. Some benchmarks show 95% improvement. So you start using them happily, and then your thread migrates to the mongoose, and it signals because it doesn't have the instruction. <laughs> and the really, really, really irritating thing for me about this uh, is that actually mainline Linux would never present that system to you. The mainline Linux would have said, oh, you only have the atomics on one core. I just will hide them from user space. So user space would have worked fine. But when we do that, we taint the CPU out of spec because we don't like it. I think we may have changed that since, and Samsung didn't want a taint, so they removed the taint, but they also removed the checking code. So then the Samsung kernel didn't mask out the feature, and unfortunately the, the Go people actually then changed Go so that it never uses these instructions if it detects it's on an Android device. So kind of everyone loses, right? And I'm very cross about this, because <laughs> Mainline did the right thing. Uh, I think the lesson we learned probably is that we shouldn't have been shouting about how the TPU was out of spec. Uh, although we can be cross that people have built systems like this, um, if we yell in the D message, they're just going to remove the code. <laughs> so I know Steve has a warning, 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 F-trace is enabled. Praise Print K, that's it, yeah. Um, but you seem to have done better with that than, than we did well, with this. Oh, ah, right. <laughs> so anyway, um, that's that one. And then time for one more. Yep. <laughs> so this was the Motorola Moto Z4. They say, feel the speed of a Qualcomm Snapdragon registered trademark 675 process. That's 57%. I mean, that 55 wasn't enough. 57% faster than a Moto Z3 Play. I don't know what that is. Um, and it's a phone built to keep up with you. So, I mean, they, 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 there's a number, right? There's a 675. So we've got something to go on, but the rest of it, it doesn't really tell you much. <laughs> and also, it's an SOC, not a bloody processor. That's one thing that annoys me. So that's a system on chip. It's got lots of different processors in it. Although, if you look at which processors you have in it, on the, I think the Qualcomm website, they don't call them CPUs, they call them something like AI compute engines or something, you know, I don't know why. <laughs> yeah, 
Um, so you go to the Qualcomm website, you find a 675, and they say, ah, CPU cores, Qualcomm Cryo, more of those registered trademarks, 460, it's lower than the SOC. Octa-core CPU built on ARM Cortex technology. Okay, so this is confusing now, right? Because they've, they've kind of dropped this little hint that maybe there's some ARM Cortex-y stuff in there, but they've called it this Cryo 460, which also sounds a bit like a SOC, and it's, it's not, it's the CPU. So again, we have to go to our friend at Wikichip. <laughs> I don't know where he gets this stuff from. And he claims that uh, the Cryo 460, there's a silver and a gold. Um, don't know why. <laughs> Uh, there's a silver and a gold, and they're completely different microarchitectures. So the 460 is based on the A55, and the sorry, the silver is based on the A55, and the gold is based on the X76, which are both ARM CPUs. Thankfully, they both implement uh, 8.2. And then there's this thing from this Anantech article, which I don't know how reliable it is, but they claim that the two big disclosed changes are to do with the reorder buffer. And but again, at this point, it's very much microarchitecture. Linux, you know, doesn't care about this. If, if it makes it faster, so be it. Unless there's a, an erratum, then we have to turn it off. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much. That was good. That's just the images. So, yeah, if anyone's got a question, I can throw the mic to them. Can you talk about, about uh, what was before ARM v3, like the ARM 26 and all that sort of stuff? Dinosaurs. Dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> no, so I, I, to be honest with you, um, I, I haven't worked on that stuff for quite a long time. Uh, but yeah, there were those like 26-bit addressing and all this kind of stuff. Uh, I think the earliest revision of the architecture we support in mainline Linux now, so this is on the 32-bit side, is ARM v4. And I think Debian still supports that, or maybe v4t. No, they still support Mark, Mark Zangier has a hack where if you have a CPU that doesn't implement BXLR, uh -huh. he traps it and then he modifies the page cache. Okay. So you don't, to, with the instruction that of some emulation, it's very, very sketchy. But it, I, I think Debian might be carrying that patch. I'm not sure. He's worth checking. <laughs> there was ARM 26 in the Linux kernel. Arch, uh, slash ARM 26, I believe. Yeah, I don't think it's there anymore. I, th I think no, ARM v4 is, the, yeah, ARM v4 is the earliest that's now supported. With risk VC, probably. Um, you mentioned that when there are different features on multiple CPUs, mm -hmm. you, Linux emulates some SMP. Um, sorry, you know, Linux emulates what, sorry? Uh, well, pretends it's SMP and they're the same. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Are there plans to make it uh, possible, I guess, with scheduler tricks or something that uh, you would expose the different features and, and schedule uh, binaries that need specific mm -hmm. ones on the correct CPUs? So I don't, there are certainly no plans to do this upstream, uh, mainly because it's a, it's a really, really awful scheduling problem. So actually, the big, assuming that you have the same features, just scheduling uh, for the big cores and the little cores, where the only difference, the only observable difference is a performance difference. Even that has taken years and years and years to get upstream and lots and lots of uh, blood, sweat and tears to, to make it work. So then saying, oh, by the way, you, you, know, you only have floating point on CPU 3. Uh, <laughs> you, th you then, you know, what if someone hot plugs it off? Well, now you probably need to forbid that, but you only need to forbid it if there's a task running that's been using floating point and then it's, it's, it's a big nightmare. There are, I mean, people have spoken uh, about systems where maybe you only have 32 bit instruction support on some cores, and could we do that? And I really don't want this upstream, to be honest with you. It's, it's an enormous maintenance headache. Um, so, no, I mean, you could, you could try hacking it up, but I imagine you'll run into lots of problems. Thank you. So since uh, some of the ARM machines have uh, Cortex-R cores and mm -hmm. Cortex-A cores, can you do SMP between these two? So <laughs> The problem you'd run into there is they wouldn't be cache coherent, and the, t the well, in fact, you don't even have an MNU on the R, so probably not. I mean, <laughs> the best way to the best way to communicate between them would probably be to run two separate, like run an RTOS or something, and then have it treated as a device by the A class, and then can communicate with a mailbox or something. I oh. think trying to run a full fat Linux isn't going to work because if you take the lowest common denominator of features. I don't think there's anything left. 
just wondering uh, in terms of the roadmap mm -hmm. for ARM, um, if the big little design approach will continue or do you think uh, the SOC designs will be more uh, homogeneous in the future, like just go all 64-bit for example. So is this like a transition or is this here to stay? Okay, so um, that's a really complicated question. I think the short sort of answer <laughs> is it depends on the, the market. So for the mobile uh, designs, uh, heterogeneous seems to be pretty well uh, embedded there and I think it's relied upon uh, for the performance power trade-off, um, which is what some of the marketing blurbs are trying to hint at. For the, the people that are trying to get into the service base, and we're still, you know, it's an uphill battle obviously for ARM because there's a big established uh, architecture there called x86. Um, for those systems, uh, I don't see heterogeneous CPUs as being a thing, uh, mainly because if you're trying to displace uh, an existing architecture that doesn't do it like that, if you come with your whole load of baggage, by the way, you now suddenly need to worry about all of this heterogeneity, um, it, it's not going to be particularly appealing. The heterogeneity in those markets probably becomes comes through things like accelerators, um, and, and how they interface with, with an operating system is it's still, it's still an active area of development. Okay. Oh, there's one more from Matt and there's one from Drew as well. So, uh, since ARM kind of displaced MIPS uh, some years ago, do you think Risk Five is going to displace ARM? <laughs> <laughs> I don't work for ARM anymore, but I got to be careful. I mean, they're paying for me to be here. Um, I think it's, there's, there's some interesting challenges for Risk Five, uh, in particular. Their <laughs> One of their big um, plus points is the obviously the fact that the architecture is open source and people can do fun things with it. Now, with that comes fragmentation. Uh, so managing, it's kind of like, we have to manage in ARM, we have to manage the fragmentation and diversity of the way the soft's designed. They have to manage that within their instruction set. And if they crack that, uh, I think they're a very strong contender, but it, it's a very, they need to encourage the people to use it, which often means that you, at the beginning, you get lots of fragmentation. And then if they manage to control it, that will be, the, I think, the test of their success, in my opinion. Oh, and you kind of went over a little bit, but the, the numbering of the cores, mm -hmm. I never understood. And like, what, like, there's this missing gaps. Like, I'm assuming like someone started a design and then like threw it away, and like, <laughs> there's just like some incrementing counter, and you can't go, I don't, I don't know. I, so I don't know uh, how they come up with the numbers. Okay. Uh, it's, this, it's definitely not. Um, you know, they, it's not incremental and all the ones in the yeah. didn't exist, otherwise we'd have had like, you know, tens and tens of failed CPU yeah. projects. Um, <laughs> what does happen is that, uh, actually I should have mentioned this, one, one thing that does happen uh, is that, I mean, desi designing a CPU is really, really hard if you want to validate it properly. Validation takes up most of the time. So if you've got a, I don't know, an instruction decode unit, which is validated and it kind of, it works and it does all the instructions you need, you're kind of daft to rewrite it every single time. So there's lots of IP reuse between CPUs, which is not, you know, you can't find that out unless you look at the, the RTL typically. So you can have, um, in fact, this was on Wikichip as well. If you look at the Cortex A76 and you look at, uh, I didn't even mention this, the new cores are called Neoverse, not Cortex. So there's a A76 and a Neoverse N1 like they're quite heavily related uh, microarchitecturally, but you wouldn't be able to tell that from the name. So I really, step one of my, my bulleted list, which is ignore all of the marketing gunk. Ignore all of the marketing gunk. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm out of time. Thanks very much. <laughs>